Today I've got this nice extreme value problem that I found on the Math Stack Exchange. And what I think is interesting about this problem is it involves this kind of like inductive definition of the function that we're trying to maximize. And so this is maybe a step up from what you would see in a differential calculus class. Okay, so anyway, let's see what we have. We want to find the maximum of f of x, which is defined to be sine of x plus the integral from minus pi over two to pi over two of sine of x plus t cosine of x, all multiplied by f of t dt. And so that's what I meant when I said we've got this function that is kind of inductively defined in terms of itself, or maybe recursively, but it's like a continuous type of recursion here. Okay, so maybe the first thing that we wanna do is split this integral up and see if that helps at all. Um, another thing that is potentially important to notice is that sine of x and cosine of x are both constant with respect to the integral, so we can pull them out. So that gives us the following maybe more efficient version of our function. So we have sine of x plus sine of x times the integral from minus pi halves to pi halves of f of t. So that comes from this sine of x multiplying into f of t, and then plus cosine of x times the integral from minus pi halves to pi halves of t times f of t dt. So looking at it like this, it's clear that we need to get a handle on the integral of f of t over this interval and the integral of t f of t over this interval. And how can we do that? Well, we can interestingly get some simplification if we integrate this entire equation with respect to x over the same interval. And so that's introducing some sort of like double similarity into this situation. Kind of being inspired by the fact that we've got these integrals over that interval from minus pi halves to pi halves already. Okay, so anyway, let's do that. So we've got the integral from minus pi over two up to pi over two of f of x dx will in turn be the integral from minus pi over two to pi over two of sine of x dx. That's from this first term, but then we're gonna have it again here as well. And here it's going to be attached to this integral of f of t. So I might as well write this as one plus the integral from minus pi over two up to pi over two of f of t dt. Okay, so just to reiterate, this thing which I have the blue underline is coming from factoring the sine of x out of this and then of course integrating over you know x from minus pi over two to pi over two. Okay, good. So then we can do the same thing with this second term, this cosine term. So that's gonna give us something like the integral from minus pi over two up to pi over two of cos x dx times the integral from minus pi over two up to pi over two of f or of, sorry, t f of t dt. And now here's where some nice simplification comes in. Well, maybe before we talk about that nice simplification, let's just point out that all of this right here became our product of these two integrals. Okay, and now we're ready for that nice simplification I was alluding to. And that is, well, the integral from minus pi over two to pi over two is sine of x is just simply zero. You can see that two different ways, either using the fact that sine is an odd function and we're integrating from like minus a to plus a, or taking the antiderivative of sine, you'll get cosine, but cosine evaluated at pi over two and minus pi over two is zero. So anyway, this gives us zero. And then likewise, integrating cosine of x from minus pi over two to pi over two gives us the number two. Just by, I don't know, maybe using evenness again, it's two times the integral from zero to pi over two, but then sine of pi over two is one. Okay, so now let's bring that down and see what we have. 
So we've got the integral from minus pi over two to pi over two of, actually what I'm gonna do here is switch out my x integral for a t integral, which is totally okay, because that's just a dummy variable, if you will. Okay, so f of t dt equals, well, all that's left is two times the integral from minus pi over two to pi over two of t times f of t dt. Okay, so I think that's looking pretty good. Maybe we'll put a box around it because it's gonna be something we wanna hold on to. And then let's also see what we were able to get rid of. And we were able to get rid of on the right-hand side of the, this equation, the integral involving f of t. We kept the integral involving t times f of t. So now we might wanna to think to ourselves, what can we do to get rid of this integral and keep the integral from t f of t? Well, in fact, what we can do is multiply this entire equation by x and then integrate it over the same region. So in other words, we're gonna have this equation x times f of x equals x sine x plus x sine x times our integral. Again, I'm just recopying this down. Okay, so now that we have that written out for completeness, we'll integrate this entire equation with respect to x from minus pi over two to pi over two. That's gonna give us another version of this integral, setting up like a system of equations, if you will. Okay, so we have the integral from minus pi over two up to pi over two of x f of x dx is equal to, well, we'll do the same trick for this bit right here. We'll have the integral from minus pi over two up to pi over two of x times sine of x times all of that other stuff after factoring out. So that'll be one plus the integral from, again, minus pi over two to pi over two of f of t dt. Okay, and then we'll have plus the integral from minus pi over two up to pi over two of x cos x dx, and then this thing left over. <clears throat> so minus pi over two to pi over two of t times f of t dt. And the great thing about this is it cancels the other term. So I'll let you check that, but if you take the integral of x sine x over this region, you end up with the number two. So that's a fairly easy integration by parts um, integral. And then if you take the integral of x cosine of x over this region, you're gonna get zero. Maybe that's even easier to see because that makes an odd function. Well, cosine is even and x is odd. We're integrating over a symmetric domain. Okay, so in the end, we have the following second formula, and that is the integral from minus pi over two to pi over two of, I'm gonna replace these x's with t's, t f of t dt is equal to, well, let's see, it'll be two plus two times the integral from minus pi over two to pi over two of f of t dt. Now let's put a box around that as well and see what we have with our green boxes. Notice we've got a system of two equations and two unknowns. So we definitely have two equations and our two unknowns, well, the first one would maybe be this integral right here. And the second one would simply be this other integral right here. Those we wanna think of as our two unknowns. Okay, so let's bring that information to the top and then we'll actually solve this equation. Okay, so I've introduced a little bit of notation. I set A equal to the integral of F just by itself and B equal to the integral of F multiplied by T. Of course, over that interval that we were talking about before. And then that system of equations that we built before now looks like this. We have A equals 2B and B equals 2 plus 2A. So now let's go ahead and solve that system of equations. So let's plug this value for a into our second equation. 
So that gives us b equals 2 plus 2 times 2b, but that's otherwise known as 4 times b. Okay, but now we can do some quick simplification and we'll see that that means negative 3b equals 2, which means that b equals negative 2 thirds. Okay, so that's good. We were able to find one of the values of our integral. Now let's find the value of the other integral, but we can easily get that just by, well, notice that a is equal to 2b, so we can multiply by 2. So we have a is equal to negative 4 thirds. Okay, great. But now where do we go from here? Well, let's look over at our definition of our function and observe that using this notation, we can replace this integral with a and this integral right here with b, giving us this more compact version of our function. So f of x is equal to sine of x plus a times sine of x, and then plus, well, that's gonna be b times cosine of x. So like I said, b times cosine of x. But we know the values of a and b right now. We'll replace this with minus 4 thirds. We'll replace this with minus 2 thirds. So that tells us that we've got, well, actually a quite nice function. And it will be minus 1 third sine of x minus 2 thirds cosine of x. So after all of that work, what we've done is reduced our problem from something that would not typically be done in a differential calculus class to a problem that would be typically done in a differential calculus class. Now, how do we find the maximum value of this? Well, we're gonna take the derivative, set it equal to zero, and test that we have a maximum. So we can go through this quicker, I think, just because this is more like standard calculation. So the derivative with respect to x, so that will be minus one third cos x, and that'll be plus two thirds sine of x. And we want that to be equal to zero. But for that to be equal to zero, what do we have? Well, that's gonna simplify down to two times the sine of x equals the cosine of x, which is the same thing as saying, well, tangent of x is equal to one half. Okay, great, so let's put a nice box around that. But that doesn't have a nice solution. So in fact, we won't find what x is, but we can find what sine and cosine are using like some trig tricks. So let's introduce a triangle. Let's say this has angle x, and since tangent is equal to a half and tangent is also opposite over adjacent, we have a one here and a two here. But then using the Pythagorean theorem, we can check that this is equal to the square root of five. But now since tangent is positive, that means that sine and cosine have the same sign, S-I-G-N. They're both either negative or they're both positive. So the question is, do we wanna take the negative values or the positive values? But since sine and cosine here are both attached to minus signs and we're looking for a maximum, that means we'll wanna take the negative values. So all of that is said that when we have a maximum, we have the sine of x is equal to, well, let's see, that's gonna be opposite over hypotenuse, so it's gonna be negative one over the square root of five, again, because we're taking the negative value. And then cos x will be equal to, well, that's gonna be adjacent over hypotenuse, but we're gonna take the negative one, so negative two over the square root of five. Okay, but now putting those values of sine and cosine into our function oh, right here in the blue box, what does that tell us our maximum is? Well, using just like straightforward arithmetic, we'll get that our maximum is the square root of five over three. So I hope you enjoyed the video. If you've stuck around this long, maybe think about subscribing. It would help the channel out a lot. And that's a good place to stop.
Thanks for watching and sticking around until the end of the video. And since you're here, don't forget to gently press that like button, subscribe, ring the bell, and select all notifications to never miss a video. If you want to get your name in the credits like you see here, access the live seminar series, review videos before release, and more, go to patreon.com slash michaelpenmath and become a Patreon member today. If you want full ad-free course content, subscribe to my second channel, Math Major. I've got courses on linear algebra, complex analysis, and proof writing, among several others. And that's everything. Bye.